Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 18th. Today's topic is from astronauts to Zimbabwe, the A to Z of global collaborization. Our special guest is Steve Sherman. Our show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy Moore for doing the closed captioning for us. And if you want to use the closed captioning, click on the CC up in the title of the audio video panel, and you'll get another window that will let you see what's being said as we go along. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will now introduce Steve Sherman, our special guest, and ask him the newbie question. Just thought I'd nudge on mic since it might not have been noticed in chat. Let's see, Paula, uh, turn your mic on. That would certainly help. I am so sorry. Let me begin again. Hi, everyone. This is Paula Noggle, and I am thrilled to introduce Steve Sherman. I had the pleasure of getting to know Steve through a group on Skype called Hello Little World. I quickly learned about his passion for math, or math, as it is called in the large part of the world. I also learned that he has a larger-than-life personality. He happily agreed to Skype with my students and entertain them for 45 minutes with his math brain teasers. Steve is the chief imagination officer of an educational NGO, which is a non-governmental organization in South Africa called Living Math. He teaches approximately 4,500 students weekly in schools around Cape Town and now recently the world. A few years ago, Steve challenged himself to teach in over 100 international classrooms through Google Hangout and Skype. He not only wanted to see if international students would enjoy living math curriculum, but to also spread the joy of numbers in education. He achieved his goal in less than five months and says he hasn't stopped since. Over the last few years, he has taught kids in India, Honduras, Israel, Trinidad and Tobago, Malaysia, and many other countries. Meanwhile, in Steve's home country of South Africa, Living Mass has a presence in 40 Cape Town schools and runs an outreach program that improves learning in poverty-stricken areas across his country. He is passionate about sharing knowledge and empowering young people. He is also a multi-award purchasing educator and his and was voted the most adorable educational innovator by his unbiased mother. He feels that it is his destiny to spread the joy of problem solving and creative thinking to anyone who is willing to listen, and even to those who are not. He knows karate, jujitsu, and two other Japanese words. Steve is an Olympic medalist for the short jump and an accomplished yo-yo winder. That just gives you an idea of his sense of humor. It is with great honor that I introduce you to Steve Sherman of Living Mass from South Africa, and I ask him this to answer this newbie question. What is the difference between global collaboration and global connections? So Steve, take it away. Wow, Paula, thank you so much for that very, very generous introduction, um, partly because I wrote it myself and also because you know, it's often, you know, when you hear people talking about you, you start listening and think to yourself, you know, that sounds like an interesting person. I'd love to connect with them. And then you realize they're actually talking about you. So it was quite surreal to hear all of that. But the newbie question is, what is the difference between global collaboration and global connections? And my answer to that would be, if, for example, you are teaching a class, and you would like to find out more about France, you might connect with a French school and maybe sing some songs. And effectively, what you're doing is a global connection. 
But when it comes to global collaboration, that is when you take the connection and you add intent. In other words, you actually want to do something together. So for example, um, two or three days ago I had a, a Skype call from Uganda and a teacher was trying to demonstrate the connection part and then I turned it into a global collaboration and by doing this I asked them what does it cost for a bottle, a one liter bottle of coke in their country and then I found out what it cost for a one liter bottle of coke in our country and we compared the prices they gave their currency I gave my currency and then I converted their currency into our currency and by doing so I was able to establish if coke was cheaper in our country or their country and what we were doing is we then started discussing economics and why would certain things be cheaper in their country or my country and we actually had a collaboration of information and I think that that's something that, that many teachers should strive for that it's not just I mean you obviously first have to make your connection but afterwards you go for the global collaboration hopefully that explains it clearly Um, am I taking it that I, you would like me to carry on and, and do my presentation? <laughs> Absolutely, Steve. You just carry <laughs> on. All right. Do you just remember that if you give me a platform, it might never end. But anyway, let us start off. Uh, all my contact details are obviously available on this page and in all the other connections that uh, Paul and Peggy have put out for you and, and Laurie as well. And if you need any information, uh, it might be worth visiting our website because we post new stuff all the time. Just to give you a, an indication that my computer screen is doing some unusual things while I'm presenting. It's, it's showing several layers of the same screen and originally I thought it was duplicating it but it's not. So I'm hoping that I am advancing the slides in the right way when I intend to. So I'm going to go to the next slide and let's see if it works it's not advancing so maybe what you can do is if you can advance the slide for me and then I will try to chat to you about each slide I'll just tell you when to advance the next one so what is living math well living math started off as um, a very simple exercise where there were these two kids at a uh, school in Cape Town and they were doing exceptionally well at mathematics and they were very smart and the teacher felt they needed additional stimulation so she asked one or two of the at the boarding house the house masters would they be able to give some brain teasers and problems to these two boys and what started off as two boys became eight or nine boys and what started as eight or nine boys became one boy with a sister who then said you guys should come to our school and do the same thing and then they were in two schools but of course there were only two of them and they were not able to get from school to school so they started advertising for facilitators and I obviously applied and once I started I realized this is what I'd like to do for the rest of my life so I proposed that maybe I should take the program over from them and after a couple of months of working for them I then took it over and what happens is we get to inspire young kids we get to show them the excitement of science technology engineering and math and the way we do it is to go into the class we are human beings we're not computers and we physically get them excited with our personalities and, and hopefully with our knowledge on various math and science topics and we love promoting problem solving we love promoting creativity critical thinking skills and of course because 
this is the 21st century and many of the kids that are working right now are being trained and I saw the question what does NGO stand for a non-governmental organization um, many of the children are being trained based on curriculum and methodologies that have been around for the past few hundred years but of course the world around us is changing on a daily basis so it's very important that we give them the kinds of skills that they need to cope and to, 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 to tackle the, the, the world around them and, and I think that those tools of technology, creativity, problem solving, I also believe that skills in, in presenting and, and communication, those are critical as well and of course once we started doing that things grew from there we started interacting with uh, organizations like NASA and Google and when it came to having the astronauts arrive in South Africa then I would be the go-to guy they would come along and say to me uh, could you please take these astronauts around to the schools and for me being a space fan it would be like oh sure if you really insist and once we got connected there a lot more opportunities started popping up and what is interesting is that of course not only did we get involved with that but then the Imagination Foundation which is a fantastic organization if you've ever watched the video Kane's Arcade and I'll type it in the chat here hopefully my computer will behave uh, Kane's Arcade um, it's a lovely story about a young little kid who was building uh, arcade boxes. Um, he was building arcades out of cardboard boxes in his father's workshop. And that was during his summer holiday. And no one had come to play at his arcade until Nirvan Malik, a filmmaker, came past the store and asked him what it was all about. And he bought himself a fun pass. Now, regular uh, cost to play would be $1 for three turns but I think a fun pass is five dollars for a hundred turns and Nirvan obviously saw a good deal and he bought the fun pass and was playing at this thing and realized that here was a young kid who's got the most incredible imagination and no one was actually acknowledging it besides his parents so what Nirvan did was he organized a flash mob and the whole of Los Angeles came down to the father's workshop to play at his arcade and there were hundreds of people all busy playing his arcade there were such cute machines and he would climb into the box and if you won then he would push the tickets out through the hole and then he had all his own toys from his room that he had up on the wall that you would swap uh, for the tickets and it was just the most ingenious thing and what happened was because of this video that went viral people donated money and once they started donating money they reached enough money to cover his college uh, fund and then of course and only being nine years old um, that would be quite substantial money by then um, they had a surplus so they decided to form the Imagination Foundation and the Imagination Foundation is there to promote creative thinking and, and learning to build it's a bit of a maker movement uh, there's a little bit of coding and, 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 and all aspects of using your mind uh, and developing your mind and we were nominated as the first one of the first 30 chapters around the world and if you've got any chapters wherever you are there is no cost it's absolutely free to join a chapter and we get to do really really cool things so for example uh, last week we were preparing for the inventors challenge which ends um, next week so if you want to still enter you can to go to the imagination foundation inventors challenge um, the kids just have to come up with an idea for an invention and then post a video of what their idea is and they could win some awesome prizes um, and of course we were just practicing our green screen filming because we're going to show the kids how to uh, make a video using uh, an iPad app called do ink and green screens the week before that we made solar ovens where we had to make s'mores and cook them outside in the sun because of course as you know right now in Cape Town it is summer and we've got 50 degrees Celsius 
and the kids got a chance to literally cook their own marshmallows, chocolate and biscuits to, to make s'mores. We got to measure the temperature outside and the kids were absolutely amazed that something so simple could be built in a session and of course they went home and did their own cooking. Um, the week before that we made the perfect bubble mixture and of course when you've got the purple, perfect bubble mixture it enables you to make giant bubbles. So of course while that was going on um, there was a, a wonderful opportunity a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2012, to, I saw an article in the paper about a teacher who was teaching in India and he was teaching his class mathematics over Skype and this was quite new in the world in general and I thought well, I would love to do that so I contacted him and he said sure let's do it and I got connected with Chandrakan Singh and his beautiful school Chaitanya Gurukul out in the rural area of, uh, of India but what was interesting about the school is that the entire school was pretty much built over Skype. How they managed to do that, to check out the plans, I mean they couldn't go and visit all the time, they managed to build the school with engineers and local people from the village and it's a two-story building school, they don't have electricity but they run off generators yet they have a full computer lab and Chandrakan Singh had this vision that with blended learning you could bring computers into the classroom and give access to the best teachers from around the world um, for his wonderful school and because of that I got so excited I decided to challenge myself to see if I could teach a hundred classes in the next year and of course I've done way more than a hundred classes and I did that in the first couple of months and I realized that connecting is wonderful but global collaboration is very meaningful it enables and empowers teachers to not only just make a connection but to learn from each other and exchange knowledge and culture and I think that right now in the world around us uh, there is no shortage of a need of cultural understanding, tolerance and uh, appreciation for other people who come from other countries. Of course you're not going to talk politics because you know there might be people who support either side but it's important to, to understand that if you want to progress you need to understand where other people are coming from. So that is Living Maths in a nutshell. I mean we do so many other things as well. We run bingo evenings, maths evenings, we uh, are involved with the National Science Festival so we go out to the various international festivals in Botswana and Namibia and we go do math shows and in May I'm going up to Durban, a beautiful city in, Ca in South Africa to do the first math show for deaf schools and last year in November I did the first math show for blind schools which was an incredibly interesting experience. You know when you work with someone like a friend of mine um, she is a blind astronomer and she was going to be doing work at local schools in Cape Town and she said to me you know it's so interesting working with blind kids because they learn differently and I said well you know what I've never done a math show for blind kids why don't we plan one and all of a sudden that came about and then when I went to a conference I met people from the Deaf Association and I thought well you know what deaf kids they can still see and I can still be, be very visual in what I do let's see if we can do and adapt a wonderful school show for kids who can't hear me and, and maybe when, when they hear my voice or see unfortunately they have to see my face there's nothing they can do about that but at least they can participate meaningfully in a math show so we're doing lots of very different things we do a lot of TV work, we do a lot of um, newspapers, we're involved in so many things but at the end of the day it's my goal to try and promote math to as many people as possible to promote science and for people to become scientifically literate because if you don't believe in global warming if you don't believe in science unfortunately it can have a detrimental effect when you are underprepared when things happen so I think it's important that we get lots more STEM out there for the people so that's enough talking about that stuff I think it's time to show you some photographs and explain what the photographs are about if there are any questions 
I, I'm hopefully going to be able to see some of the questions because I noticed that, as I said, my screen is hiding some of the text, but I see Peggy and, and Sebastian are typing lots of things um, in the text there as well. So let's see, global collaboration versus connection. So here are a couple of examples of connections versus uh, collaboration. So I would say mystery Skype or mystery animal or mystery number is an example of global connection. And how does it work? You basically pick a, let's say a school out in Nepal and they call you via Skype or Google Hangout, whatever it is that you want to use, and they have to try and work out where you are. They are only allowed to ask yes or no questions and they have to learn that when it comes to asking questions, you can't say, are you in this country? Are you in that country? It's important to teach the kids the skill of narrowing it down. So we teach the kids, are you in the Southern Hemisphere? Yes or no? Uh, are you living in a, a place where you are surrounded by water? And once you start moving towards specific areas, then of course you can start asking, are you in this country or are you in that city and get closer to the answer. The same for an animal. I can think of an animal. The same thing for a number for the younger kids. You know, I could think of a number from 1 to 50 and you can ask me, is it an odd number? Uh, is it less than? Is it more than? And that to me is what global connection is about. Global collaboration is when you actually collaborate on a project. And one example is the currency challenge. And if you wanted to do, you could try it right now. In fact, let's do that. Why not? You know, this is, this is the show that we can just throw things at it. Why don't you work out what it costs you for a one liter Coke, if you have a Coke in one liter bottles, um, can you work out what it would cost you in your country? Type the price in, and you're allowed to Google it if you're not sure, maybe the local store will pop up on the actual screen. And I know that for us, one liter of Coke, do you know, the one liter is what is that, it's almost a pint, you know, a bottle of Coke. It's a small bottle. Well, let's do a can, a 340ml can. I don't know how many, now you see, this is a lovely exercise because Laurie says 16 ounces. I'm thinking, what is 16 ounces? So, so now, so if you buy two liter bottles, let's do a two liter bottle. What does it cost you for a two liter bottle? Then we can compare apples with apples. So two liter bottle of Coke. I'll just quickly look, work out the price over here. And according to my list over here, all right, I know what it costs me. Hopefully you know what it costs you. Mine is going to cost 16 Rand and 49 cents. Now what is interesting about that is, let's take for example, I noticed that someone said in New York it was 279, is that correct? And I see 158. Wow, it varies in price all over the place. That's quite a large discrepancy between prices in the U.S. Okay, let's take, let's take 158 at Walmart. So if I had to do a quick calculation, 158, and I multiply it by 13 Rand 40 to the dollar, your Coke is going to cost you 21 Rand if I compare my Rand to yours. And that's very interesting. Uh, 227 dollars, let's just, uh, let's just work out what that would be, 227 times 13 rand 40, that's what it was a couple of days ago, 30 rand for a 2 litre Coke, so that's almost double the price that we would pay for it in South Africa. And of course, 
Sebastian said it would cost 50 cents in India. So if we had to do 50 cents, multiply that by 13.40, Sebastian will cost him 6 grand 75. That's almost half the price, which is under half price uh, for us. So India is definitely the cheapest. New York is definitely the most expensive. And of course, you can work out uh, from other countries. So what we could do is have an exercise where kids can go and research the cost of a Big Mac, uh, what it would cost for a Kit Kat, uh, general things that you can find in all countries, and then compare the actual currencies. And then you can talk about why things would be cheaper in India or why it would be more expensive in America. Are they selling more units in that particular country? So you can start to see where it goes from a connection to a collaboration. Another example of collaboration would be the Imagination Candy Challenge. So all the Imagination chapters we met and we thought we need to do a fun project involving all the kids. So I propose that we do a candy challenge where we send a bag of 10 food items to one of the chapters. And I created a Google spreadsheet. And then the kids get to taste each thing. And they give a rating. And then the facilitator takes the average rating for each item. And then they put the ratings on the spreadsheet. And then that chapter will send a bag to another country. And it will have, obviously, things from their country. And what we want to do is find out when we've taken all the items from all the different countries and we rate them, what are the top 10 candies or snacks from the world? And if this is successful, then we're going to propose that this goes a little bit bigger to all the chapters. We've got about 100. And I think that that should be quite exciting. When the kids get the parcel, they get to open it. They get to taste things from other countries. They get to ask questions about it. And, and David, you're absolutely correct. Food is always a winner, uh, in particular when you get to taste food from another country. And what is interesting is that someone was telling me, and I never noticed it when I was in the US, that Coke in the US tastes different to Coke in South Africa. And the reason is because in America, they use fructose. But in South Africa, we use cane sugar. And that impacts on the taste. Apparently, ours is nicer. So when I proposed that our chocolate was better than your chocolate, you can imagine there were gasps. But Hershey's is so amazing. So we will find out if indeed Hershey's has got competition from our particular Cadbury's. <laughs> and then, of course, we had lovely resources. Um, if you go onto our website, I know Peggy's put a lot of them in the, in the live binder. But if you go to our website, livingmaths.com, um, under the menu, resources, we often put many resources there. But there is one in particular that says uh, cyber mail links. We send out an email every week with brain teasers, puzzles, and announcements of events and things. Plus, we also include great links for teachers. And we always put those links in a Google Doc on the menu there so that you can always access them. So they are there for you. Please make use of them if you choose to. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of teachers will then contact us and make a connection to ask questions about the resource. And then I insist on a collaboration to come out of that connection, which is always cool. And another wonderful example is one of our colleagues from the Hello Little World group. Um, he often gets his kids to do their orals their presentations, and he streams it live. And we get to watch it as an international audience and as teachers. And then he shares a Google Doc with Google Forms. And we are able to then mark the presentation. And they get instant response on the Google Sheets, because as you know, Google allows you to do that. And the kids love the fact that they actually have people from other countries watching them and then giving them advice or tips to make sure. And of course, Dave, you're absolutely right. The parents can watch it too. And that also allows for um, transparency 
so the parents know what is actually going on at school. And I think that's pretty cool, because when I was back at school about 300 years ago, they never had that sort of thing. So I've always found that being able to, to offer that sort of facility to parents is amazing. So let's go to the next slide, because apparently I can talk behind the heads of a camel, and we still want to describe some of the pictures. So very, very quickly, this one over here, uh, a very good friend of mine, Don Thomas, is an astronaut. He's done four shuttle missions, and... Uh, my daughter's class was doing space for their theme, so I asked him for a small little favor, and he was happy to Skype with the kids in class, and he is wonderful at speaking to kids, to adults. I mean, he's based in the U.S., and if you ever need someone to come to your school, uh, he charges very, very low fees, but definitely he's probably one of the nicest, nicest astronauts you'll ever meet. And he gives a wonderful presentation on his experience on going to space and how he was turned down 19 times. And that did not stop him. He's got a brilliant, brilliant message on, you know, space and, and that sort of thing. And then, of course, a little bit lower down, one of our imagination chapters was having a fancy dress competition. And they asked us to please judge the fancy dress. They needed an, an independent judge. So, of course, a few of us from uh, different countries, we were able to watch the uh, fancy dress parade and make some comments, and the people were quite appreciative to, to hear feedback about uh, the, the outfits. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, this one's a little bit busy. So let's start off with the Jamie Rose, if you go down to the bottom picture, you'll see a lovely uh, young girl with pink hair. This is one of my students, Jamie Rose, and Jamie Rose, unfortunately, developed a form of leukemia. She had some tumors, and, and she had leukemia, and she had to go for um, chemotherapy. And it was devastating for her, it was devastating for her peers, it was a difficult time for their family. So what did I do? I said to the school that there's absolutely no reason why Jamie can't join the class virtually. So she's got a, a laptop at home. We got her to join in via the internet. The kids got to ask her questions about her illness. And I think that's very important that young kids, they don't understand what cancer is. They don't understand what chemotherapy is. And they are obviously very worried and concerned. And Jamie Rose, she was able to tell them, I'm okay. She was able to explain what the procedures were that she was going through. And I think that from that point of view, it allayed their fears. It made them feel a bit more calm and relaxed. But they also felt very special because Jamie Rose was participating in class. And she managed to complete the year. And she did very, very nicely because she was able to keep up with all the work. And it was always a delight to have her join our classes as well because she's a very special girl, that one. And unfortunately, she did have a relapse. And she's been in Austria for the past year um, getting treatment. But the good news is that so far it's all been, been good. And she's coming back to Cape Town in, I think, about two weeks' time. So we are all very excited about her arrival. And we've got this rivalry going because she claims to be a good chef. And I've told her she can soak up all the culture she wants. But when she comes back to Cape Town, she's going to get a butt kicking in the kitchen because I'm going to cook a meal that... And she can't use her mom as an unbiased judge. Forget it. We have to have a real panel of judges to determine who actually made the best food. And then, of course, to the left of that picture... There's a young girl holding up a piece of paper. This was one of my favorite activities. A colleague of mine in Denmark asked me, could I please run a lesson on reading in Danish for his slowest readers? And I had to remind him that I don't speak Danish. I don't even know a word of Danish. But I have eaten many apple Danish, and apparently that doesn't count. So he said to me, come up with something original. So what I did was I invented a word search from a P 
poem. I asked him to send me a poem in Danish. And then what I did was I read the poem to the kids in my best Danish. And of course, since I can't read it, my pronunciation was pathetic. And they were in stitches. They were laughing. And I would say, well, if I can't read it properly, can you help me? And he said he's never seen his kids so enthusiastic to help someone actually read in Danish. And then I gave them this word search based on the key words of the poem. And they had to go and find the words from the poem in the word search. And they would have to come up and actually show me on the piece of paper where they found specific words. So there was a, an online collaboration between two teachers and our classes where I was teaching kids to improve their Danish and I could not speak a word of Danish. So I enjoy that sort of activity. And of course, if you go along to the other photographs very briefly, you'll see just above Jamie Rose's picture, there's a, a, a group of kids in assembly. They asked me to please do a math show at the school. And I said, unfortunately, for me to get there in the traffic and get back to go and do my other show, it wasn't viable. But if they were willing to do it online, I'd be happy to actually do the show over the internet. And they said, well, that would be fantastic. So they got all the kids into the hall, and I did a full-on show over the internet. And some people say, but don't you have to physically be there? And the irony is that no. If you use the technology wisely, you can certainly get a wonderful message across. And they all participated. They all enjoyed it. And what was interesting is when I got to the school the next week, many of the kids who I'd never met before came up to me to say hello because they remembered me from the presentation. So it just shows you that it can still be meaningful even though it's done digitally. And then, of course, uh, to the left of that, we have a young girl with her hand up in the air. I often conduct regular classes each week. And every now and again, we invite schools from around South Africa, all the world, to join us. And in, in doing so, they get to participate in a fun living maths lesson. And if there's time, at the end, I'll give you guys a brain teaser to give you an, uh, an example of the type of stuff that we do with our kids. And there above, we had uh, one of our regular classes. And we brought another class in from another country. And the kids got to ask each other questions about your favorite music, about your movies, your food, your dancing, your sports. And they got to actually learn about each other's culture, which was great fun. To the left of that, uh, just above, we had a teacher's workshop up in Johannesburg. Just because they're in a different city doesn't mean that you can't run a workshop over the internet. And what I do is I use Google Hangout because it allows me to stream it live on YouTube as well so more people can benefit. And then when the actual uh, session is over, you have the YouTube video to share with people as they need it. And of course, we put a lot of those on our website on livingmaths.com. And finally, the top right, even though ISTE is quite far away, I was still able to join in on the fun. Uh, a couple of my colleagues were running a session, and they were talking about global collaboration. And the best way to do that is to bring teachers in from around the world to show people what it's like. And I noticed that 44% of you indicated that you hadn't connected. I hope that you are going to email me, and we're going to get your first connection going. Because once that happens, you are going to get so hooked, you're going to start to look at other opportunities. And you will probably want to connect with other experts in the classroom or teachers from other parts of the world. OK, let's go to the next slide. I know it was quite short. I don't know if I've got too many left. Uh, this one, of course, is really, really great. Um, one of the most amazing things is when you go into the poorest areas in South Africa, they really don't have much. And they haven't seen the internet. Many of them have not seen computers. And in the bottom right-hand corner, this was a group of kids out in a township called Guguletu. And I got my iPad out and connected to a class in America. And they could not believe that they were talking live to America that day. They couldn't believe that the people on the other side were actually in America. And they were asking questions. And because they were both in grade 7, 
they found that there were so many common things that they shared, which I think is absolutely amazing. It's so nice to open people's eyes to what the rest of the world is like. And that's how you break down walls. That's how you break down barriers when people get to know each other and realize we're just people on each side. And then, of course, Kahoot. I know many of you have probably played Kahoot. If you have not played Kahoot, you should go and slap your wrist now and go and sign up ASAP. Kahoot is a wonderful online quiz platform. We work very closely with the Kahoot team. Um, I've got a chance to, to work with the CEO, um, Johan, and because of all my feedback that I gave him, he flew from Norway to Cape Town to meet me, and a lot of the developments within Kahoot have been because of discussions that we've had. And, and being an ambassador of Kahoot, I've even had a chance to now test out the new Jumble feature, and if you haven't tested that out, oh, you must definitely go and try that out. So, and I see there are some questions there, and I will get to that as well. Um, the, the Kahoot up, up on the top, that was basically working with a group of kids who don't have devices. So how do you play Kahoot in South Africa when I've got the Kahoot quiz, but the kids do not have a device? And the answer is quite simple. What you do is you give each team four pieces of paper, four colors, and what you do is you put up the question on the board, and each team selects their answer, and they run up with their piece of paper, slam it on the desk, and if they can get there before the time is up, then you count their answer, and if they don't, the answers do not count. And of course, this is a very exciting way to engage the kids, because you can make sure that every one of the team gets a chance to be a runner. You can get the kids in the class with our technology to just play the game, and it really, really is amazing. Now, there was a question, and if I can get my screen refreshed, uh, maybe I can see that question about uh, normal days in classrooms. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, what is a normal see. day? What's okay, that's a better idea. A normal okay. school day in South Africa, and how do you manage the time difference when you do these collaborations? Good question. So a normal school day started about eight-ish, ten past eight, depending on which school you're at, maybe some of them are quarter past eight, and they go throughout the day. Obviously, American schools, if you are six hours behind, and we finish at, let's say, two o'clock in the afternoon, which is 1400, that means you're there at eight o'clock in the morning, it can be a very tight call. Many of the European schools connect with us during the school day, so in Norway and, of course, Denmark and, and Germany and, and Austria, that's never a problem. And sometimes Australia, but now here's the thing. When I connect with a lot of these schools, it's just me on my own at home. Like I'm with you now, it's, it's about 7, almost 8 o'clock in the evening here, but you guys, it's still morning. So I run sessions with the kids in, on your side despite the fact that I don't have any kids. But then we might have an event. For example, an interview with a famous person, and we bring an audience, and then we interact with our audience and your audience. So it certainly can be done that way. And then we can go to the last slide, and then if there are any questions, we've still got a couple of minutes left, so let's see if we can uh, finish off. Uh, yeah, okay, the second last slide. So go to the next one there. So one thing that we've now run back. No, there we go, interviews. So one thing that we do is online interviews. I think it's so important to give teachers and students access to people who are at the top of their career or people who are absolutely fascinating, but kids who would never get a chance to connect with these people. So I just put down five examples, but if you go onto our website and you click on interviews, there are many interviews that I've done, and because we stream them all live, obviously you can join in as a class. And I'm hoping that you will email me and say, I would really like to join one of your interviews with my class so I can invite you to participate. There is one coming up on Tuesday, and I'll tell you about it. Um, the interviews above, on the top left, Derek Paravicini. He is blind, severely autistic, but he can play any song you give him on the piano. And not only that, you can name the key, and you can name the genre and he will switch the song into that key and that genre. He is unbelievable. And if you watch the interview, he's just the most incredible guy. 
You go down below, you've got um, Phil and his lovely daughter, Emma. These two, um, he started Daddy Hair Factory. So he started being a single dad, he started doing his daughter's hair and started uh, putting videos up on YouTube for other single dads to learn how to, um, to do their daughter's hair. And that led to him launching the Daddy, uh, I think it's called the Daddy Hair Factory, where he literally has trained pair, like dads to go out and teach other dads to do their daughter's hair. And he says, yes, it is about the hair, but it's more about the bonding and the connection that you have with your child. And he's just the most incredible person. And, and his videos are going all over the place, all over the internet. So if you get a chance to watch him, he really is entertaining. Uh, in the middle last week, we had um, Pinchas Gutter, and Pinchas is a Holocaust survivor, and we got a chance to hear his absolutely fascinating story about how he managed to survive six different uh, concentration camps, um, how he managed to get to the Holocaust alive, and, and what was his experience, and what he could remember from his youth. I mean, going into the concentration camp at about eight years old and coming out at 14, you can imagine for a young boy to see what he had to see, uh, it, it certainly must have done much damage. But he's the most, I don't know, for his age, to be able to remember everything with such detail, absolutely phenomenal. Um, on top, we have um, Professor Tim Noakes, who is a well-known sports scientist in South Africa, and he has written many books with regards to sports science and running and drinking water and athletes. But what has happened recently is he spoke about the Banting diet, which is low-carb, high-fat diet. And he was pretty much trying to uh, promote this diet. And of course, when you, when you start promoting something like that, dietitians are up in arms. How can you promote something that could be potentially dangerous. Eating lots of fat can't be good for you. It's dangerous. It's going to kill you. And what actually happened is they've taken him to court for promoting this diet that's been around for 100 years, quite similar to Atkins and, and, uh, and the others. And people are saying that the results are phenomenal, that their diabetes and all those sorts of things are disappearing. And he was taken to court. And if he wins this court case, the results are coming out the 21st of April. If he wins, they are going to have to go to every single dietitian and every doctor in South Africa, and they're going to have to retrain on what they've been taught. And if you watch the interview, he will talk about the fact that it's not pseudoscience. He's an A-rated, A1-rated scientist. He's been uh, rated like that for the past, I don't know, 12, 15 years. So he really is a fascinating guy. And then if you go down below that, uh, we have the head of NASA. This is uh, Charlie Bolden. Uh, I got to meet him when he was in Cape Town, and obviously when I asked him for an interview, it was the first time in history that a head of NASA has ever given a Google Hangout interview. They normally only use proprietary software like Zoom and all those sorts of things. But for me, he said he would do it, and he absolutely had a ball. We had schools from all over the world joining in. We had kids asking him lots of questions. And he loves kids, and he was only happy to answer all the questions. And it's not often that you get the head of NASA making himself available. So we often try to interview interesting people. And um, coming up on Tuesday, we have Sydney Island. She's from the US. She is a girl. She's a, 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 a scout, a Girl Scout, and she's achieved the highest level that any Girl Scout could ever achieve. And now she's gone to the Boy Scouts and she's doing all of their challenges too. She has won many, many awards. But the highest achievement you could ever achieve in the Boy Scouts movement is the Eagle Scout. And they won't allow her to do it because she's a girl. And she feels that that is discrimination. So if you would like to join in on that interview, that's happening at 6 p.m. Cape Town time. And that's GMT plus 2 for those of you who want to check. Um, and you can always go to worldtimebuddy.com if you want to compare your time with my time. And then in March, I'm going to be interviewing a former neo-Nazi who was part of the white supremacist group in the US and how he changed his attitude 
and his feelings towards other people and then started a non-profit to promote love and not hate. So we've got lots of those interviews coming up, a few astronauts, we've even got the lead actress of the Mars series, so that's going to be coming up soon and we put all of that on our timetable, uh, our calendar on our website and you can always check it out and please email me if you have a class and you want to join in. I'll just bring you into the hangout. We love having you join us. And then the final slide, because I've only got one minute left. <laughs> Let's see what happens. We're going to be doing more interviews. We're going to be doing lots more global collaboration. And you can join me. Boom! Did it by 8 o'clock. Well, that's, I think it's your 12 o'clock or something like that. Are there any questions? I think you're going to have to ask the question with voice because unfortunately I can't see the Yes, text. I'll do that, it's Steve. I'll ask the questions. I had captured some from chat. Cool. Uh, you did answer a couple of them. Somebody was interested how many administrators have participated in your activities? School administrators, I Administ my guess. Ah, yeah. You mean from an educational point of view? Okay, so our administrators are slightly different to yours. I have run many workshops mm -hmm. with administrators and local teachers from the area and their administrator and they are very supportive of what we do. But of course, right now, there are many schools that don't even have computer labs and they are getting mm -hmm. fiber installed. And then what do you do when you have fiber but you don't have computers that defeat the exactly. purpose? So we are helping to educate many of these uh, administrators who are a little bit behind the times. And the thing is, it's not about preaching. If you preach, they don't want to listen. But if you involve them in an activity where you, you connect with another country or you have a famous person and you invite them to participate, you'd be amazed how they go back to their colleagues and go, this is something we need to do. So I've always believed that do it by example and not necessarily by preaching. So by sharing all my things with you, I'm hoping that some of it resonated with you and you're going, well, I want to get involved. How do I do it? Let's contact Steve and he'll get us involved. Great. Let's see. Um, you've answered this in the presentation. Peggy asked, you discuss a lot of different things with your collaboration, and it's not just math, correct? Correct. And in fact, for example, um, I was asked by one of the schools, could I run some of the high school kits, not math related? and I ran a wonderful activity called Cafe Dilemma. And if any of you would like the sheets, I'll gladly send them to you. Cafe Dilemma is imagine kids sitting at a table and you bring them a menu, but instead of serving them food, you serve them food for thought. So you serve them a topic, for example, capital punishment, and you give them four points for and four points against. And the points must be compelling, and you give them two minutes and they have to come up with a point. They either have to be for or against. But we all know that it's going to divide the group. We all know that it's going to challenge them. We all know that their opinions are going to then be challenged because they've got preconceived ideas about the death penalty. But when you pose a question like, or when you make a point like, but by killing people, are you teaching them that you shouldn't kill? I mean, isn't that uh, hypocritical? Uh, all of a sudden, they start thinking, well, maybe that's, that's valid. And what happens if you get it wrong and you've murdered someone? So we, we start to challenge people in other ways. So it's not just mathematics. If it's education, Terrific. I'm excited about it and I'm happy to get involved. Somebody asked, yes, I, I've, I've got a... Any other questions? <laughs> read back to the list I have. Um, somebody asked about that, the name of the school in India that you first okay. mentioned, I think. Okay. I'll type it for you. It's a fascinating story. Chaitanya Gurukul and Chandra uh, 
can sing. I think that's his name. Yeah, he is the guy that's I involved there. And are they probably on Facebook and on the internet. If you just uh, Google, uh, just Google it. The activity we did about the the Coke prices. Does that pretty much compare with cost of living as well? Have you yep. discovered that? That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Does it? Doesn't it? Well, you see, then you start looking at what does the loaf of bread cost? Mm -hmm. And maybe Coke costs more in your country because it's made in another country and it's imported. So is it really fair to say that the Coke is the yardstick that we should use to measure cost of living? And, and this is the discussion that comes out of it. The kids are going, no, that's not really a fair way. So what is a fair way? Well, then they say, well, what about rent? What about uh, taxes? What about, um, uh, I mean, obviously, there's a, the Big Mac scale. You can go along and look at, I mean, Big Mac's prices are fixed around the world. But even though they are fixed, the prices still will be cheaper to buy right. it in some countries when you compare Do you pay taxes your currency and coke with their in South Africa? What is mm -hmm. interesting is that although we don't pay tax, I mean, we pay VAT, uh, which is included in most things, a value added tax, like a GST. But what is interesting is that uh, mm -hmm. the tax man has decided that they are putting a sugar tax on any soft drink or food that includes sugar, they are going to have to pay a sugar tax. And that means right. that the price of those things are probably going to go up because they want to obviously cover their costs. But now what's happening mm -hmm. is a lot of them are changing their recipes to include things like stevia. So now we used to have Coke, Coke Light, and now we have um, Coke something, Coke Life I think it is, but it's got stevia instead of sugar, and it's supposed to be a, an, um, a replacement for Coke Light. But of course, yeah, I mean, it, it, that varies from one exactly. country to the other, but um, the tax is there for the government to collect money as well. How would we find the contact information for the NASA astronaut that you shared about? Is that on your website? Um, if I recall correctly, Ohio, let me just type in Ohio astronauts. I'll find the link and then I will put it up. Here we go. This is it. It is, let me go back to that page. It is ohioastronauts.com. And all you have to do is mention me, and hopefully, here we go, there's the link. If you contact him with, uh, on the website, Great. just mention me, and, and hopefully he'll do something nice for you. <laughs> How do you introduce yourself to these amazing people to get them to agree to be interviewed? Now, that is a great question. I've learned one thing in life, and that is if you sit within your comfort zone, you are never going to leave. So if you don't climb out of your comfort zone, you're never going to grow. And I like to grow. Sadly, other parts of my body are growing too, but that's a different story. I find that if I want to grow as a person, I must also learn that mm -hmm. when I ask, people might say yes, and if I ask, they might say no. And you know what? I've come to terms with the fact that the worst thing they can say is no. So I ask. And generally, because people have said yes in the beginning, I then have a history of doing interviews. And then I go and tell people, look, here are examples of the ones I've done. I mean, I've even interviewed the head of NASA. And the people will go, well, if he's interviewed the head of NASA, then he must... He must be worth doing an interview with. And it just, you know, cascades from there. So it's about climbing out of your comfort zone and asking. So when I saw an article on Facebook about this one guy in South Africa who was paraplegic after a motorbike accident, and then he went on to complete um, one of the hardest motorbike rallies in the world, um, I emailed him and I said, I admire what you did and I'd like to interview you. He emailed back and said, 
just say when we can do the interview. When I saw Sydney was the scout on Facebook and she was fighting against the Boy Scout movement, I then emailed her and I said, I'd like to interview you. Mm -hmm. And her dad said, sure, let's do it. So, sure. you know, in general, people are happy to do it if you ask. But they're not going to do it if you don't ask. What's the greatest number of people you have had play a game on Kahoot? Mm. I think one of the sessions I was in, there were about 600. Mm -hmm. And just to be fair, it wasn't only South Africa taking part. So what we did was we took part in a World Kahoot and there were several schools, so the one person would then stream the actual screen so that their, screen, their school could see it and then they would stream it and then it would be in a Google Hangout so people who were watching that on YouTube could also see it and of course the people participating in the Google Hangout could mm -hmm. see it and it was a crazy, crazy session. But I think the record is over 3,000 that Johan and his team did in Norway, uh, they had seniors take part in a giant cahoot. If the teacher amazing. wanted to share the link about the video interview on the 21st, where can they find that URL? Um, we normally put it on Facebook and, and other things, but I will make a URL. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've got it on, on, if you go onto our website, it should be on the calendar, and if you click, there should be a little bit of information, but I will add more information to it okay. uh, in the next few minutes so that at least you can share that information with your, your students. And That's those were the questions right I was now. able to, to capture as we were going along. I don't see any others in recent chat. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show since we went a little bit long. But thanks mm -hmm. so much, Steve, for, for sharing today. I think people learned a lot. Cool. You're absolutely welcome. And thank you for inviting me. There's, there's no greater joy than sharing mm -hmm. what I'm passionate about. And, and if we can convince some of those 44 percent who have not connected uh, to start Terrific. considering it. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will then uh, introduce what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Steve. We are definitely inspired, and we've got lots of things to explore after we close the session. Um, we have some great shows coming up, and I hope you'll all think about coming back to join us. Next week, Brad Spearson is going to come back and give us an update on Participate. They've had a lot of changes, and it's a fabulous place to hold Twitter chats and participate in them. And and he's got a new partnership with EdCamps, and he's going to tell us all about that next week. Um, we won't have a show on March 4th, but I hope all of you will think about going to the Global Student Conference. You can still even have your students participate in that. It is a student conference, and the presenters are students. And the theme is STEM and entrepreneurship. So I know that's going to be a fabulous day. March 11th, Jennifer Wagner is going to join us. You may know her from her projects by Jan. And she's also going to talk about not at ISTE, which is something I mentioned in the chat earlier. Great way to participate in ISTE. If you can't afford to go, you'll get to see lots of the things that they're seeing without traveling at all. And March 18th, we're going to hear about Blooms, which is an awesome app for parent communication. March 25th, we have a, another featured teacher joining us. Ken Ehrman is a fifth grade teacher in Pennsylvania. And April 1st, we're going to have Desiree Alexander back. And her session is all about creating video and screencasts. She's calling it Not Your Grandmother's Video. 
And then on April 8th, we have Adam Bellow joining us for Breakout EDU. So you can see we have a lot of awesome things coming up, and I hope that you will plan to join us. This is a slide that just lets you know how to find the student conference that's coming up on March 4th, and that link is also in the live binder, so you can find it there. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar series. So you can sign up for a collaborate room like this one. And as long as your session is, is to the public, open to the public, it's also free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this website. There's also a tab in the resources section of the live binder to do that. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection is on iTunes U at this website, and there's also a tab in the resources area of the live binder, as well as a way to get to the survey for this show. Here's the direct link for the survey. You can take the link in the chat box or from the live binder. At the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out with your name, uh, thanks to Patty Ruffing, who's, who does that and sends it out. Make sure you request this to be sent to a personal email address. Schools tend to block these from arriving to you. Special thanks to Steve Sherman, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for a webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>